Why do I have to sit there? Come on. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Um, Ooh, I'm right. honoured and thrilled to be sharing the stage with these two legends who've already formed a mutual appreciation society. You are fans of each other's work, I believe. Well, how could I not be, man? Very much so. So, <laughs> yeah. In fact, I, I officially own uh, probably more Buzz Lightyears and Woody's <laughs> than I care to admit uh, <laughs> yeah. via my children. Well, that's good. I, you know, I, I think about some of my favorite videos, too, and I think about, there was one you guys did that was, it kind of was like a um, homage to, like, a Lumiere Brothers. Oh, yeah, Tonight, which, Tonight, Tonight. Which is awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah, so back, uh, so that uh, video, Tonight, Tonight, was uh, shot by Jonathan uh, Dayton and Valerie Ferris, um, who went on to do uh, Sunshine and some other great new movies, but... Just to put it in perspective, um, uh, and how important video was back then, as you know, uh, in the 90s, because it was such a big part of the cultural movement that became you know, music at that point. Um, we spent $1.1 million on that video. Mm. And nobody even batted an eye. Wow. Yeah, it's usually, it's usually for us, it's about, I can't remember if it's about a million Every, I, I, I don't even want to say if it's wrong, but yeah, it, it adds up. I know for these movies, they're like $250 million, right. you know, so I can't remember how that, what that adds up to for every minute. A lot. Yeah. Very few music videos be made for a million now without some brand paying for it. Yeah, right. No, it's, uh, it's uh, very true, but uh, very indicative and, uh, of the times back then. You really... You know, you video was such a well in the in the '90s. I mean, you know, we um, she, you know, shuddered and were in complete fear of having to be video stars because we were just some weird-looking guys and girls from Chicago. Um, but really, um, you know, kind of fell in love with the medium and really embraced it as a new uh, way, uh, a new medium of art, and um, really had a lot of fun doing it. But yeah, the economics. Once the economics fell out of the music business, the, the million dollar video didn't make sense anymore. And I, I can't believe it took me this long to notice it, but if you watch the 1979 video, <laughs> there's a scene in the, in the shop at the end where the kids are causing trouble. Two cops come in, look at the cop with the mustache. He bears a very striking <laughs> to Jimmy. <laughs> and speaking of cameos, you know in the Pixar movies, where the, the Pizza Planet truck mm. always mm -hmm. puts into appearance, and I've driven to bed to it with my kids, trying to see where the Pizza Planet truck is. How do you decide where it goes? I mean, is there a whole, how does that happen? I'd love to know about the decision-making process. Of yeah, well, it was, it was easy for a long time. It was like, but then once you start hitting movies like Brave, <laughs> right? Does anybody know where it is in there? I won't tell you, you figure it out. But yeah, then we're trying to sneak it in, sneak it in those films. And of course, if anybody is interested in whether the Pixar theory is true, yes, it is true. Okay? I, I heard somebody clap there. That's good. Um, Which theory? That everything is connected. All the Pixar films are part of one universe. You got to watch this with your kids, man. Wow. It's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. So how do you decide, like, how do decisions like that get made in a huge organization? When you're making, you, you started as one of 50, now you're one of 1,500. Like, yeah. how do creative decisions get made in an organization well, like Well, it's... It, We've been really fortunate because at Pixar, we turned the whole process of making movies upside down. Usually in Hollywood, it's the execs that are on the top, guys who went to business school, you know, the producers, and they make the final decisions, what the, what the characters are going to be in the film, all that. And then the creative people have to come in and whatever limitations have been set up for us, we have to do the best job creating this. But at Pixar, we turned it upside down. The executives were all the directors. They were the writers. They were all went to that school that I went to, Cal Arts. And so we had this, we called it the brain trust, where all the creative decisions being made at the company were not being made by execs or CEOs, was being made by the creative team, the directors, the writers. So it's a very small story team. And so when we make decisions of what the movie's gonna be about or where we're gonna put in a Pizza Planet truck, it's just 10 people in a room trying to crack each other up. Wow. 
So you not know. that dissimilar to a band then, because I mean, for me, a band is like the ultimate organic economic unit. You have these adults or almost adults coming together to throw their lives together and, and work together. And what, so what was the decision making process like in the Pumpkins? Well, I mean, we worked really hard to keep it um, as autonomous as we could. And uh, to your point, you know, uh, once you get into uh, accepting money or accepting wisdom, uh, you know, you get into uh, a negotiation, right? And we just didn't want to engage in that type of relationship with our record company. So when we made our first album, Gish, it was funded by our first two and a half years of work. So we knew that if we took record company money, we were going to be... Um, you know, having things dictated to us that were uncomfortable. Um, so for us, you know, we saved up $30,000. We went and made that record with our own money. We produced it with Butch Vig. We didn't let anybody in the studio until the record was done. Uh, that record went on to be CMJ Album of the Year, and that set the precedent for how we worked forever. We never let the record company in the studio. We always, we were never letting them in hearing demos. We were never letting a and R. I I mean, to a point when we got to know our A&R guys better, we would let them in to hear stuff, but it was never uh, for an, to entertain an opinion. So, Jimmy, did you have a business head on you, as we say in Ireland, from day one? Um, I think, you know, the nature of the band was really to try to understand as much of the business as you could, because we knew, you know, Chicago being so close to Detroit, we had seen so many bands get ripped off just by not having an underst a cogent understanding of the business. So we knew... Going in this, you know, Billy and I were both big readers. I mean, we read, you know, back then it was called This Business of Music, which explains mechanical royalties and publishing. So when we negotiated those early contracts, we were smart enough to build in reversion. So every seven years they reverted and we were able to renegotiate. It has everything to do with why we have a business today. I mean, you talk about, you know, people not making money in streaming or this and that, but really it comes down to kind of what deals you're able to foment. Um, early on, and a better understanding of the business certainly allowed you uh, to go in, um, you know, on the balls of your feet, as we say, and not on your heels, you know, getting, uh, you know, spoken down to or uh, undermined by somebody who knows more about the business than you do, so. But how do you reconcile that balance, Matthew? <clears throat> you, you're creating art, and the art needs to be successful so you get to make more art, but yeah. that, that tightrope between commercially successful, popular, money-generating versus your soul and, and sharing the stories you feel. Well, you know, first off, I'm going to say, as as a creative person, I don't know if I if, if you would feel the same way about this, but actually having limitations of not as much time and not as much money is actually a blessing. Yeah, it's when you have too much money and too much time that's like a curse, you know, and so it's that's why I feel like so many startups. Even when Pixar was starting up, we, we had a lot of limitations. So we had to be really scrappy about uh, being very resourceful with what we had to work with. And, and also one of the things that was working for us is that the people who had the vision, the dreamers, the artists, we were the ones in charge. And we had Steve Jobs, who was our financial backer, and pretty much Steve was awesome because, you know, as an innovator himself, he knew, I'm not a director, I'm not necessarily a writer, you guys, this is, you guys know what you're doing, I'm going to support you, I'm going to help you guys shine. And whenever you have any type of art where you can get as close to as a pure uh, of what your vision is, the better it's going to be. And, and I can tell you, the closer it is and more pure it is to the vision of whatever that is, it's going to make money. It's just like you got to kind of trust those creative people that to let them do what they do great, you know? And, and uh, were you able to transfer that ethos, Jimmy, from music then when you started getting involved in, in more regular businesses? Like you were telling me a story there about what business you were involved with. Like, there's been lots of businesses for you. I mean, to, to take that, that logic, how, what was that transition like for you? Um, again, you know, I think um, for me, the, the, the attraction to technology was really just culturally, right? Cultural uh, movement around technology in 
the late 2009, 2010, was very akin to the movement uh, in and around the grunge movement in the, the, the early 90s. Um, you know, I saw uh, uh, a lot of similarities between the people that were attracted to it. Um, you know, I, I thought that, you know, if this was 1993, the guys that are writing algorithms right now would be wearing flannel and strapping on Stratocasters rather than, you know, going out and, and coding. So. For me, it was always just, you know, I'm very OCD by nature, as you probably all have read about my journey, but uh, I don't really do things halfway. But I, you know, really um, have a, a, just an ability to read and assimilate information in a way that allows me to do different things. And I've always been interested in kind of, um, you know, redefining myself and moving through different verticals. So my journey in technology was as simple as, you know, I understood content. I understood uh, the importance of efficacious environments in regard to consuming content. I transferred that ideology to digital and then just proceeded to read um, you know, every book I could get my hands on from you know, Eric Ries to Innovator's Dilemma to Horowitz's Hard Thing About Hard Things to Peter Thiel's book and, and just kind of threw myself into it and really um, you know, tried to make it uh, uh, as sacred as a space as, it, as, as the music business was. Um, and, you know, those are the types of things I enjoy. I enjoy, you know, learning and relearning. Those books you mentioned are amazing. Like, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, I think, is one of my favorite books of all time of, of any description. It's just like, it's, it's a book about battle. Well, and really I learned is. more about hip hop reading that book <laughs> as well than I ever knew, so. That, you know, for you making the transition from being an artist within Pixar to, spitting out your own business and, and developing that. What was that transition like for you? And, and did you read up on any particular books or how did you? Well, you know, growing up in a family that was all about business, and I mean, and it was a good thing that the, the business was toy stores because, you know, we've had three, three generations. My, my parents, grandparents, great grandparents have owned a chain of toy stores in San Francisco. So that's probably what I was gonna do was run the businesses. And so I've always had, I've always been surrounded by businessmen, but my dad and I, were, we, were the, we were the oddballs. We were the creative ones who wanted to be animators. So, you know, while working on all these movies and seeing how we were making people feel through, you know, the, the visual storytelling we were doing, I started to see the same connections that my family was using with the toy stores. Being able to create hooks to get people into the stores, to then change them and make them go through a transformation. And I started noticing, I was like, these are all the steps we do to make a movie. So now when I'm working with companies and I'm helping them create a feeling for behind their brand, behind their identity, I'm doing the same thing like I'm designing a movie or working at the toy store. What kind of toy store hooks? Like, well, give me some classics okay. from the 50s. Okay, all right. So <laughs> we used to have a giant gorilla that was about six feet tall, stuffed gorilla in the front window of the toy store. And it, would, it was mechanical. It would wave, had a funny little bow tie. We had so many people come in the store because of that. And it just goes back to if you can't hook people within eight seconds, at the beginning of a song, yep. or beginning of a movie, or when they're walking by your store, you've lost them. So you have to, that's the, always the first thing I, I think about in story, is how you can hook people. Well, that, on that hook, but that's what amazed me, the start of 1979, it's got this abstract little kind of funky sub-techno beat that's got nothing to do with the rest of the song, but it, was that a hook? Was that an add-on? Like, when did that come in the, in the workflow? Well, I mean, in the pumpkins, you know, there was an accountability to each uh, instrument to be uh, representative of the feeling of the song, right? And it wasn't just about playing drums. I mean, we, you know, I put as much time into constructing drum parts as we did into everything else. And we really were of the mind that when you hear a drum part, you should be able to recognize the song just purely on that drum part. Because when all uh, the components of a song are doing their job, you get this kind of beautiful orchestral tapestry of emotion, right? And to your point about like producing, you know, what I'm gonna be talking about later are just the similarities between, you know, even composing a song or running a toy store, a uh, toy story, a uh, toy store, or uh, running a tech company, right? Because it's all about 
we're all trying to compose or produce something that's compelling, right? And if we break it down into what are the variables, I mean, what are the things that define things that are compelling, right? If it, whether it's art or a movie, they all have some type of rhythmic foundation, right? They've got a rhythm, they've got a narrative, right? They're in harmony with their environment, right? And they have some type of cultural connection as well. And the thing they all have in common are they have hooks in it, right? Yeah. So once you understand that process, you can simply apply that to any mechanism and, and create accountability across the board. This is what my product needs to have. This is what my movie needs to have. This is what my interview needs to have. This is how my relationship with my wife needs to be. This is how I raise my kids. I mean, really, I, I use this mechanism all the time to really quantify uh, the value or how I'm proceeding in any type of environment. It's like life as a series of product market fit sprints. I mean, it's a little vulgar, but I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I mean, we can say that here, but if you said that to my wife, you'd probably be eating your lunch alone, right? Hey, look, this conversation's all about product market fit, right? No, it's about uh, you uh, going over here, right? But, um, but no, I think, um, look, we're all rhythmic beings. Nobody really wants to be quantized. We're all kind of imperfect in our, in, our, in our existence. We want to celebrate um, what's unique about our identities. And to you know, Peter Thiel's point, we want to identify what we can monopolize about ourselves and really put that forth as our strength. With the pumpkins, you know, we had a lot of uh, aces in our, uh, up our sleeve with a great songwriter, you know, a very um, kind of explosive, uh, exploratory, uh, adventurous drummer. Um, you know, and those things added up to uh, a pretty good band. I think people who create businesses are, are fundamentally want to make the world a better place because you, you see something, you're like, I can make it better. You could have sat in Pixar and just stayed there and kept ticking mm -hmm. along, ticking along, lovely cushy existence, getting to do what you love. But you were like, no, I want to do this other thing as well. Like, like what was it that pushed you out the door to go, I want to do this other stuff. Pixar is not enough for me. Well, I mean, first up, I, I, I worked on 10 movies there. They were almost all the original ones. And I, I find whether it's for a, a film company or for a tech company, you want to keep inventing new things. You want to keep doing new things. And if you start, like what the Greeks used to say, rest on your laurels, you know, you, you, you run some great race in the Olympics and you win and you can get treated like a king forever, but if you run that race again, you may lose, so you just don't run again. I want to keep running. I want to keep doing new things. I want to keep pushing myself. And I feel that the true uh, example of great companies are ones that keep taking chances. They keep pushing the barriers. They keep doing new things. They don't rest on their laurels. And I'm not ready. I spent half my life at, at, at the Disney company, which has been awesome but I'm not ready to rest on my laurels. I want to keep doing new things. Uh, were they not like going, what's wrong with you? Are you well, some I'm kind sure. of weirdo? Well, my dad, you can imagine, my dad was the first one. <laughs> what the heck? What, what are you doing? But I'm already, I'm already working with some of my favorite directors now. I'm, I'm working on uh, film scripts with them, and it's new. I think you need to shake things up every once in a while, you know? Um, most of the time, I think probably 10 years is the limit you should work at a place, but I was there for you know, over 20 years, so I'm ready to take the next chapter. And there's a real satisfaction in being an educator, of, of course, which is something, Jim, you're spending, you said most of your time now you see yourself as an educator. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with what Matthew says. I think, um, you know, being an artist, there's, an, there's a responsibility to evolve and to continue to evolve, and really that's kind of our role. Um, is to keep demonstrating an ability to re-identify yourself in, in different and more challenging environments um, because that's, that's the idea. That's why I play in a jazz quintet and a quartet. You know, to your point, I mean, <clears throat> it's the attraction of immediacy and being forced to improvise on the spot that, you know, really brings out the true musician in me where it only takes, you know, the last record we made, it takes as long to listen to the record as it did to make it. <laughs> you know, it's a live recording. <clears throat> Pumpkin records, not so much, right? I mean, you're talking about a year. Um, but again, you know, you have to be, um, 
you know, willing to put it out there and say, like, how much of my past am I willing to, how much of my present am I willing to mortgage by mining the past <clears throat> or second-guessing the future, right? And for me, it's always about staying in present time, trying to avoid things with the word reattached to them, you know, and really kind of moving uh, in present time without, you know, trying to be the puppet master for the future, but really just kind of being available <clears throat> for whatever kind of comes your way. And I think that's the best way to celebrate uh, a life as an artist. Matthew, your daughter did agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel is, if, you're, if, if you truly want to embrace being an artist, you've got to keep doing new things. You know, I feel like that's like the true definition of a great company is one that keeps taking chances, <clears throat> you know? But back to that art and commerce thing, I mean, so what I think is interesting is, you said earlier, Matthew, about success is basically a byproduct of doing something you, you love that's yeah. great. But then, for me, what complicates things somewhat is when you get to the stats of the investor, and the investor comes along, and you have been an investor, Jimmy. So I, I'd love to have that two sides of the fence, because when you're an artist doing it yourself, you're bootstrapping, you're going up, that's a simple thing to understand. But then when you're satisfying an outsider who's only interested in X return, how do you square those off? And as you, for you as an investor, what was your relationship like with the companies you were investing in, and how did that work? Well, I think, I think I'm smart enough to only look at companies that I'm willing to leave alone, right? And I think that's, that's because I've been in that situation where people have tried to manipulate me or make me do things that I wasn't comfortable doing. So for me, once you understand that kind of you know, quid pro quo, you can get involved with companies that you know, you know, often it's like raising your kids, right? Sometimes you'll know that to not say anything is just as important part of raising them as telling them what you already know, right? And letting them find things out for themselves. I mean, most of my investing is done with my time these days, and I really, that's, that's really how I feel like I can be of service. I can save people time, I can connect people, I can do things like that. The money thing always seems, always seems murky to me. It always seems like, I don't know, I just, the whole kind of paying for somebody else to do work and then kind of sitting around and waiting, I'm just, I'm just too kind of restless to get into that. I'm just not a good, I'm not patient and I'm not, um, you know, good at playing kind of long ball. I want to be involved. I want to roll up my sleeves and get my hands dirty and get in, you know, and learn something. What was Steve Jobs like as an investor? I don't think he would have followed everything that Jimmy said there. Well, uh, no, but, but I got to say, you know, there's a lot of stories about, you know, Steve not being a pleasant guy to work with. I, he, I had a great time working with him. But I've, I've worked with also bad investors. And I've, I've seen that the, the investors that have, you know, been a part of companies I've worked with, the best ones are ones that they share similar passions. They, like, the ones that love animation, they love film. It's not just about, I want to run a business. They're looking at it as, I want to create something. I want to be a part of creating something that my grandkids are going to one, see one day and be proud of. Not just something that's going to make money in the short term, mm -hmm. but something that's going to really affect people in a positive way for years to come. And when you do that and, and you know, quality becomes your business plan, making things that are of quality, they'll make money. So I always try to align myself with people that we're on the same page about what we want to accomplish. I, I, did this seep through your dinner table conversations about the toy store when you were growing up? Was, was, was this the type of stuff that was literally the ethos that you soaked up when you were younger? Yeah, I mean, everything around the table, you know, we, we still, I gotta say, we still get together with all the lums for dinner once a week, because my dad still runs the toy stores. And then, uh, you know, my wife, I should say, she still works at Pixar. She's a story person as well. All of our discussions are about making people feel something. It's the experience, whether it's toy stores or toy movies. <laughs> it's and about making people feel something. Your dad was a musician. Uh, yeah, well, he was a part-time musician, part -time but, musician. You know, worked on the railroad um, uh, for, for his main job. But again, I mean, I think that's it, right? It's about emotion. It's about making people feel something. And that's really, you know, if there's a job description for artists, it's really making people feel something. Whether they feel uncomfortable or they feel great, it really, you know, 
That's not really our problem. Our job is to make people feel things. That, that was the first thing when I went to school as an artist. Day one, the dean came in and he said, whatever you guys do in life, music, theater, animation, art, make people feel something. Make them laugh, make them cry, get them pissed off. But if you don't make anybody feel anything, you've totally missed the mark. Yeah. You know? But in some respect, I think, you know, something that movies and, and music have in common is, you know, we're in a world of freemium and SaaS and all these different business models, but whether you pay for a movie or a piece of music or not does not influence how it affects you. It's not a financial transaction. You can pirate a piece of music or you can buy it and it's going to have the same effect and the same with a movie and streaming. And it's almost like the arts world, because the arts world is less about the payback and extracting every ounce of revenue is sometimes taken uh, advantage of. And, and that's something I think your, your two original industries have in common. Do you, do you see that at all in terms of the, you know, the music in theory now has a freemium model, but uh, for me there's a bit of a disconnect there in terms of the arts and what it gives to people and mm -hmm. how it extracts that value back. Well, I do know that, you know, you can get every Pixar movie online, I'm sure, before it even comes in the theater but you're not gonna fully experience it until you're sitting in that theater and you're, you're immersed in it. I mean, that's part of the experience is, is going to the theater. It's, it's seeing the movie, right? And uh, so I know there's, and I'm sure it's even more of a challenge with just, you know, with music, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about the environment, right? Again, I mean, I think the environment in which content is consumed is every bit as important as the content. And like I said, it's from somebody who stood, you know, next to every inflatable beer can in the UK and played, you know, every festival over here, you know, when you show up uh, as a young band, you're thinking these people are here to see me, right? But now you've got things like Coachella that's achieved such brand status that it sells out before they even announce any artists. So it tells you, right, that the environment is at least as important as the content. So I'm a big believer in that. I mean, watching a Pixar movie on a laptop computer is not a great experience. It's not the way that content is supposed to be consumed. It's like listening to Stravinsky, you know, on a crappy set of earbuds versus, yeah. you know, a Macintosh stereo where it sounds amazing, right? Where it can be this moving, you know, living, breathing thing. So. And that was your work with Live One and Crowd Surfing, was, was creating this second screen engagement process around events. That's yeah, it was really just a, a, a chat mechanism um, that allowed people to legitimize the content through communication, mm -hmm. right? But it's just like, you know, the concept of standing in front of a painting at the museum and wondering, you know, what you should be feeling right now. Mm -hmm. Once Matthew walks up and we start having a conversation about it, it legitimizes it in a different way, right? It creates a different environment mm -hmm. where that content is being consumed because now you're having a conversation mm -hmm. about it that, you know, brings out a different set of emotions. And how did those three years as CEO of Livewood go for you? How did you enjoy it? Would you do it again? What did you achieve? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I thought, you know, it was one of the greatest, uh, t I mean, I felt, you know, as good as I ever did, you know, being in a band. I mean, it was the same type of experience. I tried to get uh, as much out of it as I could. I had, I felt like I had a great team around me. Um, you know, I just, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think there's so many, there's so much, you know, similarities between running an organization or being in a band. I mean, it's really, you know, there's a covenant that goes there, and you've got to have buy-in from everybody, as you know, when you're on a team. I mean, there's got to be, you know, somebody crystallizes a vision, and then you make an agreement that we're all going to move in lockstep to that, to that, to that vision, right? And would you do it again? Would you be CEO of a company again? Um, I don't know if it was the right company. I mean, like I said, right now, I really feel like at this point in my life, it's about giving back. Um, I feel like. You know, education is a good place for me to point my flashlight in America. I sit on a couple uh, university boards right now, and I see, uh, you know, some, some real problems with uh, education in America, namely literacy, which, you know, affects us all. I mean, from your, from your medium to mine. I mean, when the Pumpkins were making music in 1993, 92, you know, you guys, our, our fans were, there was an intellectual movement around that music that supported the music and allowed us to be more sophisticated. People were reading Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky they are reading Nietzsche. Um, you know, they were, they were able to embrace uh, more sophisticated um, 
uh, music. You know, not so much now. I mean, you look at literacy rates in America and they're pretty embarrassingly low. I think 50% uh, of Americans read below an eighth grade level now. I mean, they're, you know, we got real problems. Um, so for me, a father of young, you know, two young kids, I think um, artists can help lead the way and, and set an example as to what the expectation is uh, for all of us as individuals and members of society, what our civic responsibility is not only to ourselves, but to, you know, to maintain a level of intellectual capacity that allows us to make choices about what's going on in our environment. So that's really, that's really kind of what I'm on about these days, not really, you know, do I want to lead another company? I really want to just, I feel like the music industry, tech industry has given me a ton. I feel like, you know, I'd like to give back. About the, do you see yourself as an artist, an educator, a business person? Well, I see it's, all, it always, it's always about story for me, whether it's creating stories or helping people learn how to be better storytellers. And, you know, I've always been very passionate about helping kids be able to be better storytellers, artists. I think it comes from my relationship with my dad, who basically, you know, helped form me as an artist. So I've always enjoyed doing that. And so throughout the years of working at Pixar, I've always been making um, books for kids, how to draw books. So I have like a, you know, this is not, I'm not trying to promote these or something, but, but I have like a, you know, six of these how to draw books for kids. Oh, and I'm always, every summer, I always take a week out to be able to have a whole week of animation, storytelling, writing, drawing for kids. Gorgeous. Because that's, you know, that's, they're going to be the next ones making the, these movies, writing this we, music. We could easily go on for another hour, but of course we've run out of time. But thank you so much. That was really brilliant. And Jimmy, you've got your keynote later at four. You've just done yours. You need yes. a break and a glass of water. Thank okay. you very much, Jimmy and I. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.